Hey everybody, uh, and welcome back. Um, we're going to have a really interesting and I hope exciting panel discussion for you now with three of my favorite experts in this field. Um, so this is going to be our panel discussion on the prevention of C. diff through antimicrobial stewardship. And I am delighted to be joined by three incredible thinkers in this field. Uh, Dr. David Yoon, who's the director of the Pew Charitable Trust Antibiotic Resistance Project. Uh, Debbie Goff, who's the Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Science at the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy. That's a mouthful. Uh, and Julia Simzak, who is Assistant Professor of Epidemiology in Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So trying to beat Debbie for the most mouthful of introductions. Uh, <laughs> so, so welcome all of you. I'm thrilled uh, to have you here. Um, as I said, I think you are uh, three of my foremost thinkers that I look to in this field. Um, so each of us is gonna present for about nine minutes, starting with me, uh, and then we'll just go into a discussion with the whole group, and I think it's gonna be uh, really great. Um, so thanks again for being here, and I'll just take it away. Um, so uh, from my perspective, unlike a lot of Americans, uh, I have, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so let me start again. Uh, antibiotic stewardship is an obsession of mine, not only because antibiotics played a substantial role in my mother's death, but because antibiotics saved my life. Unlike a lot of Americans, I've always been cautious about antibiotic use. Uh, <clears throat> I had scarlet fever when I was six years old. The infection had me in the hospital for a week while they struggled to diagnose and then treat me. Um, they initially thought I had Kawasaki syndrome and that I might die. Um, for those of you who know my mom's story, uh, you might realize that my mother was only 25 years old at the time and was a single mom dealing with all this. So it was quite a bit, uh, quite a bit for her to go through. Um, so when you have scarlet fever, the treatment is huge doses of penicillin. And one of my earliest memories is being shaken awake at least twice a night by a large looming nurse to take another dose of oral antibiotics. What you probably don't know is that from the mid 19th century through the second world war, scarlet fever was a significant cause of childhood death, causing upwards of 60,000 deaths at the turn of the century. So death rates were decreasing throughout the 20th century. It was the discovery and use of antibiotics that made scarlet fever a manageable and mostly survivable illness. Luckily for me, by the time I was diagnosed in 1979, penicillin was widely available. My mother eventually took me home, no worse for my bout with this particular strain of strep. <clears throat> and though those antibiotics saved my life, they were also responsible for my adult teeth coming in discolored and with overly porous enamel. Despite having otherwise straight and nicely shaped teeth, this discoloration has always bothered me. Uh, it still bothers me. I'm, I'm uh, uncomfortable about it right now. <laughs> um, but every dentist I saw, including the one who eventually helped remove some of the discolorization, blamed the huge doses of antibiotics I was given as a child. So while in high school and college, I tended to get strep throat at least once every winter. The doctor always wanted to give me antibiotics and I would never take them. Instead, being a young and vulnerable, I would gargle with warm salt water, drink tea and live on. Luden's cherry cough drops uh, and live on Luden's cherry cough drops. Um, I was never sick for more than five or 10 days. And by the time I was 25, the bouts of strep stopped. Uh, thankfully, I remained healthy in my 20s and 30s, and I rarely thought of an antibiotic use. As you all know, that changed with the death of my mother, Peggy, in April 20, uh, on April 21st of 2010 from a C. diff infection. Uh, like many other Americans, my mother's deadly C. diff infection began with her being prescribed a prophylactic, prophylactic dose of clindamycin following a root canal. Um, within four days, she began to experience diarrhea, and 10 days after beginning her course, she was gone. Now, prior to my mother's death, I would never have imagined that an antibiotic could precipitate a deadly disease, um, but it does, and it so often does. And so what we want to talk today is about how do we limit the use of antibiotics when they're unnecessary and ensure that those who do need them, get them. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to David to talk to us about the stewardship of antibiotics in outpatient settings. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks, Christian. Um, it's, uh, it's always great to be here um, for the, um, the Peggy Lewis Foundation CDF Summit and really appreciate the, uh, the invitation to, to speak with all of you today. Um, uh, I'm going to spend some time um, in my 10 minutes just kind of providing a brief overview of my uh, of the um, of antibiotic stewardship in outpatient settings, and hopefully that'll set things up um, uh, for um, Debbie and, and Julie's talk that follows after uh, Julie's and Debbie's uh, brief presentation right after mine. Um, can we throw up the slides? There we go. Great. Um, okay, so as as, as uh, Christian mentioned, um, I'm with the Pew Charitable Trust. As a brief description of our organization, we are a policy re research policy research organization, and within um, the many portfolios that Pew tackles um, is our antibiotic resistance project, which um, which I direct. Um, today, we're going to talk about. Um, antibiotic stewardship, and as I mentioned, our work always focuses around how to facilitate um, solutions through um, uh, public policies. And the goal for our project has, a, one of the major goals for our project has been to try to find policy solutions to adopt and facilitate um, uptake of antibiotic stewardship programs and activities across all healthcare settings, and that includes outpatient settings. Um, this we do this in um, you know a lot of times I, I just point out a lot of times when we think about policies um, we immediately think about requirements or um, regulatory uh, regulatory rules but we're also equally um, focused on making sure that the the providers and the stakeholders have um, necessary resources supplied to them to actually feasible you know um, conduct to adopt antibiotic stewardship in a feasible manner and to do this we focus on policy solutions at the national state and local levels and there are um, a lot of non-governmental entities that also hold policy levers that are very important when it comes to antibiotic stewardship so just a brief overview of how does antibiotic stewardship work we, we get this question a lot um, in terms of um, what the stewardship mean, and it, it sounds really technical, but really, it's it's a, anything that really you know stewardship is meant to be inclusive of all activities that are designed to improve antibiotic use and antibiotic prescribing. Um, that the way this has been operationalized has been that. Um, Typically, it requires some degree of some kind of a measurement of how antibiotics are being used. And most importantly, it's very important to measure these antibiotics at the individual provider level. And this helps um, antibiotic stewards as well as the providers to identify where problem potentially problematic or inappropriate antibiotics are occurring and therefore can design targeted interventions um, to correct um, and improve upon those um, antibiotic prescribing practices. And a lot of time, the intervention involves um, providing direct feedback and education to the providers on, and, 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 and arming them with tools um, and resources so that they can um, effectively address any, any um, um, areas of prescribing that could use improvement. And then we repeat the measurement again to see the impact and then that cycle repeats over and over again. And ultimately, we're talking, the stewardship is always designed with the end goal of changing the antibiotic prescribing behavior of healthcare providers. So why do we focus on outpatient antibiotic stewardship or outpatient settings? Um, outpatient settings, according to research from other countries, um, have, are, show that about 80 to 90 percent of an, a country's antibiotic use in the healthcare settings comes from the outpatient setting. So it's extremely important that this area, um, it, how antibiotics are being used in these areas are appropriately addressed if we're going to tackle as a country um, you know, to, in terms of reducing inappropriate antibiotic use. What the slide shows here is the data the CDC has been monitoring for the past several years. And as you can see that one of the challenges is that there's a huge amount of variability in terms of how antibiotics are being used across the country. And it, this is broken down by the four census regions of the United States. And historically, and it continues to be the case, um, we are seeing high levels of antibiotics, much more higher levels of antibiotic use in the southern census region, as opposed to, especially when you're compared to the lowest prescribing region, which is the western, the west census region. 
Um, the other part, the another challenge that we face is, and, and many of you are, are very familiar with this, that is the outpatient setting is a very broad and diverse space when it, terms, when it comes to the specific types of healthcare facilities. Um, so CDC and Pew have done a lot of research in the past several years to quantify and describe how much inappropriate antibiotics are, uh, are being prescribed in the outpatient setting. And um, back in 2018, we published a study where we compared um, urgent care centers and retail clinics. Retail clinics are those um, outpatient clinics that are embedded or are physically located in the retail center, such as supermarkets or um, pharmacies, and um, compared the, the prescribing rates to um, uh, how much uh, the prescribing patterns to doctor's offices and emergency departments. And what this slide is showing here is if you focus on the first set of bars on the far left of this graph, the red bar indicates the antibiotic use, um, percentage of antibiotic used are prescribed by urgent care centers um, for conditions that where antibiotics are not needed, these are conditions typically of viral nature, um, um, acute respiratory acute respiratory infections by viruses are a very common reason for um, unnecessarily unnecessary antibiotic prescribing, and um, so I, this slide is really here to demonstrate that. Um, although we know in our, uh, from our other Pew and CDC research that one in three antibiotics in the outpatient setting are unnecessary, we face this additional challenge where depending on the type of healthcare facility and the types of healthcare providers you're dealing with, that this is a very complex problem and there's not a really one fits all solution to this process. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share that challenge here with you. Um, the other challenge we run into, and I, Julie will be talking a lot more about this and I'm sure in her talk is um, there. There are some difficulties and challenges at the provider level that need to be adequately addressed. And one of the most frequent questions we get um, when we're talking to media and reporters is, anytime we we publish a study that shows how much inappropriate or how much appropriate antibiotics are being prescribed, um, the first question is, why are doctors prescribing antibiotics inappropriately? And the, the answer is not that simple. It's not as simple as, well, they just need to, you know, it's a lack of awareness of the guidances, guidelines, or medical, it's, the, it's, a situ, it's a problem with medical education. It goes well beyond that. And we, we kind of um, came face to face with those realities when we did our own focus groups and survey as we were exploring policy solutions and approaches to outpatient antibiotic stewardship. This is a study that we did with, um, um, focus groups back in 2018 as, as we were setting our own um, internal um, policy agenda. And these were all primary care doctors. We went to the four census regions and the key findings were that not surprisingly, doctors are feeling burned out in many senses, many cases when, um, especially primary care doctors, when it comes to quality measure and quality improvement, they are dealing with a lot of competing priorities and trying to elevate antibiotic, improving antibiotic use is gonna be, we recognize that this was gonna be a challenge when it comes to primary care doctors where they are constantly bombarded with new quality improvement initiatives and quality measures. Um, the other part of this uh, part of the challenge is this what we call the externalized responsibility. And that was something that, that this is a term that we coined um, where the, the providers don't believe or um, they perceive that the problem of inappropriate prescribing is due to their practices or the group, group of doctors that, that they belong to. Um, and we followed this focus group up with a survey of four, a little over 1,400 primary care physicians um, a year after our focus groups, and we found essentially the same finding here. This is a question we put up there and, and asked them to agree or strongly agree or disagree or strongly disagree with the statement. And as what you're seeing here is that when the primary care physicians were asked, how, you know, is inappropriate antibiotic prescribing uh, is, a, is a problem in outpatient healthcare settings, 91% said, yes, it is. Generally speaking, it is a problem. They recognize and agreed or strongly agreed. But when we flipped the question and asked them, is inappropriate antibiotic prescribing a problem in their practice, only about 37% agreed that that was a problem in their practice. So there is this level of disconnect um, in terms of the perception of the threat of a, a, not only antibiotic resistance, but the problem of inappropriate antibiotic prescribing. And this is where data feedback becomes such an important element of antibiotic stewardship. And we've learned that lesson many times over in the hospital setting because 
what, even the, this type of um, kind of a disparate um, perception of the problem around inappropriate antibiotic prescribing was also was also observed in the hospital setting. But once you present the data, especially to provide the how much you show them how much what their prescribing patterns look like for the individual providers, that really helps kind of bridge this disconnect of their uh, of the especially the physicians' perceptions of how how they view their own um, you know antibiotic prescribing to be. And the other, the last thing I'll point out here that we learned in our survey, and this is also not too surprising, is that one of the main challenges that we have to also address is that there is a limitation in resource capacity in outpatient settings um, when it comes to something implementing something like antibiotic stewardship. And we asked our primary care physicians in our survey how much help would they need if they were going to implement an antibiotic stewardship process that meets the core elements defined by the CD, by CDC guidance. And nearly half of them said that they would, they agreed or strongly agreed that they would need a lot of help to implement the stewardship. And this is not surprising because primary care, doc primary care doctor's offices may not have the data infrastructure, or in many cases, they don't have, may not have the time to um, look at all the, the prescribing data and design their own stewardship strategies and interventions. So this is where they need a lot of help. So the last slide, uh, last set of slides I wanted to show you is, um, as I mentioned a few years ago, we were strat doing some strat strategizing, strategic planning on our end to figure out how, to, what are the policy levers and the policy approaches and needs when it comes to scaling up widespread adoption of outpatient antibiotic stewardship. And we first looked at the model of antibiotic stewardship in the hospital settings. Um, you know, we I mentioned earlier that you know everything, a lot of things we learned of what works and what doesn't work um, comes from the the, the longer experience and the research and the the, clinic, the clinical expertise that were developed by a lot of the stewardship leaders that started their that, that had their roots in the hospital setting, and as you remember, ultimately the, the goal of stewardship is to change provider behavior uh, when it comes to antibiotic prescribing. So if you look at the left side, the hospital stewardship model looks something like this, where you had a some form of an incentive provided by the hospitals to the hospital providers to improve their antibiotic use. That may be something financial or something related to their employer-employee relationship. Um, the hospitals also had a very typically, um, especially the large academic centers, have the data infrastructure or the data analytic capacity um, to do some antibiotic measuring and, and especially at the individual provider level. And then they also have in many places infectious disease or pharmacy expertise or even quality improvement experts that can provide their expertise in terms of designing their interventions and, um, and stewardship strategies. When we started thinking about how do we replicate this in the outpatient side, it became a lot more complex. And the, the challenge became, the challenge was who, who, who can take place and provide all this support that the hospital was doing or the health system was doing in the inpatient for a hospital in the inpatient setting and who, who are the equivalents in the outpatient setting to do that and that's where we spent a lot of time trying to figure out who which stakeholder organizations not only had the policy levers but the necessary resources to support the providers the primary care doctors to c conduct this um, uh, to implement antibiotic stewardship so where we landed on was that first thing, the first idea was the payers. These are the insurance companies, the private and commercial insurance companies, um, as well as the public, Medicare and Medicaid is a good example. They are very well positioned to provide the incentives um, through re their reimbursement mechanism for quality improvements in healthcare, and then measurements of antibiotic use, because they have all the, they have a massive set of data um, that they have access to. And then the health departments, such as the state health departments, the public health agencies like CDC can help provide that technical expertise. And then the last thing, I'll, the, the, the other group that we identify is similar to the hospital stewardship experience, the health systems also have tremendous amounts of leverage that they could potentially provide all three of these for their ambulatory or outpatient facilities that belong to their health systems. And when we talk about health systems, we're talking about those, um, you know, examples would be like Kaiser, um, where where you, you have you have that sort of the, the entire spectrum of healthcare kind of under one corporate or on one, one organizational roof. 
Um, the last slide, this is my last slide I'll point out to is that we are we are at a place where there are some movements now to uh, for a lot of these different policies to um, that are being tried out. A lot of these are in pilot and testing, you know, trial phases essentially to um, to help outpatient providers adopt antibiotic stewardship. CMS has some quality um, uh, improvements and quality measure programs where they're beginning to adopt antibiotic um, use related quality measures, but we're not at a place where this is being applied, you know, uniformly or consistently across all healthcare providers. Um, I would also say that health plans have started to do provide to do their own trials of provider level feedback on how the individual providers in their net contracted network are prescribing antibiotics, and um, health systems are beginning to look at their stewardship programs infrastructure to see if there's an opportunity or if there's if there's a if they are ready to expand into their ambulatory care um, facilities. So um, that is the end of my uh, quick spiel here. So so I will pass this back to Chris. Chris, or I, should I pass it to Debbie? I think so. Perfect. Christian, you're on mute. Okay. Hi, I am Debbie Goff. I am an infectious disease trained clinical pharmacist. And in David's little flow diagram there, I am that hospital pharmacist in that infrastructure. Started and was a founding member of our stewardship program. Uh, over 20 years ago. And then I really evolved into doing global antibiotic stewardship. I work in South Africa and I've worked in hospitals across six continents, haven't gotten to Antarctica yet, but everywhere else. And so I've seen the complexities of implementing stewardship and the barriers are different, but how did I get into dental antibiotic stewardship? And how did I meet Christian? Because that really, um, help develop my passion for this. Well, first, my husband is a dentist. He's a prosthodontist. And Christian, I need you to come here because his uh, expertise is really in helping patients like yourself that have teeth discoloration from antibiotics or other things and recreating beautiful veneers. So we'll have to connect on that at a different time. But um, I remember hearing, uh, I believe Christian and I met on Twitter, if I remember correctly, many years ago, but I heard this story and I looked at their website and I was really taken back by what he and his brother were doing. Um, the story was, was so emotional and so unnecessary. And that's really what moved me, that that never had to happen. And my husband, being a dentist, we had a discussion about it. I go, how can I reach dentist? And uh, one day he came home and he said, I was being a great steward of antibiotics and it cost me a patient. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, this patient had a hip replacement 20 years ago. Her sur orthopedic surgeon, as they still do to this day, told them, anytime you go to a dentist, you need antibiotic prophylaxis or you'll get a hip infection and that'll be catastrophic. And so this patient came in, the orthopedic surgeon is long retired, and there's my husband uh, being an antibiotic steward informing his patient, well, actually, that's no longer correct. The American Dental Association no longer supports, in collaboration with the orthopedic society, giving dental antibiotic prophylaxis to all joint implant patients. There are a few exceptions. And this patient just stood there going, but my surgeon told me for life I'm to take this. And so there's the patient, really what I say, stuck in the middle of two doctors telling them opposite information and was so perplexed. She's like, I just can't do this procedure and walked out. And I just, as my husband told me that, I said, that is just so wrong. The patient should never be trying to decide which doctor do I listen to? Um, we're going to fix that. And that uh, rolled into looking at dental antibiotic stewardship. And Christian's story about his mom, you know, I just never want to see that happen again. And so that's really how I uh, evolved into this. So I am that hospital-based antibiotic steward expert that is now reaching in to a different arena. So to address David's concern of who's going to lead this outpatient stewardship, my personal belief is it is the people with the most experience. 
And that is a role that I am providing now in terms of global stewardship and dental stewardship. So going into this arena, there's a lot of differences. And Julie, I know we'll address this. And I want to bring some of that home to you today. Uh, where are these differences? So when we look at dental prescribing of antibiotics, there's a, a nice paper that just got published a year ago that asked the question, are antibiotics appropriately prescribed for prophylaxis prior to dental procedures? And there are very many specific guidelines for dental procedures where prophylaxis is definitely indicated. So antibiotics do save lives and they are indicated. But in this study of looking at an insurance-based claim of 168,000 dental visits in the United States, the number of what they call discordant with guidelines. So the antibiotic was prescribed contrary to what the guideline would state was 81%, 81%. 22,000 of those unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions were clindamycin, the antibiotic that led to the death of Peggy Lillis. 22,000 other people could have potentially died if they developed C. diff. Clindamycin is the number one antibiotic to cause C. diff. Dentists in the United States are the top prescriber of clindamycin. So you can create a guideline and it's already out there for dentists. So as David was saying when he did his survey and News reporters are like, well, why would doctors prescribe things that aren't necessary? Uh, and you have to try to answer that question. You would ask, well, why are dentists prescribing clindamycin when their own guidelines tell them not to? So here's the challenge. In the United States, 80% of dentists are in private practice. That's my husband, in private practice. You're in business for yourself. All of the current studies looking at dental prescribing are done in VA settings, a very controlled environment, or in an academic medical clinic, a controlled environment, or looking at insurance database claims. There is not a single study amongst private practice dentists, which represents the majority of dentists. But my husband is one of those. And so I said, let's do a study. You recruit your friends and I'll write the study. And that's exactly where we're at right now. And it has been eye-opening. So let me tell you some of the reasons they do what they do. As Julie tells you, you can't change behavior if you don't understand why they're doing what they do. So of course, we sent a survey out to them first to try to see what are their beliefs? Um, what are they reading? And I had to go from an infectious disease expert to a dental infectious disease expert. That was no small task because that isn't my field. And so my husband really helped me a lot as all these diagnosis of um, terms that I'm not exactly used to. And I'm working with my infectious disease physician. We do this as a partnership. And so the first question is, how do you learn about dental antibiotic stewardship? So in our study, just like 20 years ago when I started doing stewardship with our surgeons in the hospital, they don't even know what the word means. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. What is dental antibiotic stewardship? It is a term that does not have any meaning to them. So if you post a, a webinar on dental antibiotic stewardship, do you think there's any dentist that's going to listen to it? They don't even know what the topic is. So therefore, why would they listen to it? That's lesson learned number one. They don't even know what the term means. They've never heard of it. So a lot of dentists that are the more mature, experienced dentist, stewardship didn't exist when they were in training. So they don't even know what the word means. Um, but I think what's most important, and, and David Pugh has the ability to impact this, if you don't see the consequence for your prescribing, you will never change it because your belief is you're doing good. You're helping your patient by giving them a 10 day course of antibiotics because no one's ever told you there's been any harm from the antibiotic. And so that is a huge disconnect in trying to change the behavior prescribing of antibiotics and dentists. They've never been told 
they're prescribing is creating any harm. And you may read an article and just like you showed, David, they think it's everybody else. Yeah, I think antibiotic resistance is a problem and a lot of doctors prescribe wrong, but not me. So dentists may read that article and say, oh yeah, you know, antibiotics can cause side effects, but not in my patients because I've never seen anybody. So here's what happens when a patient gets an unnecessary antibiotic from the dentist and develops horrible diarrhea. And just like Christian's mom, she didn't run to her dentist when she developed severe illness. You go to an emergency room, you're not going to the dentist. And so that emergency room admits you and, you know, you may have C. diff and you might survive it and then have chronic C. diff. If the patient doesn't call the dentist and tell them that, that dentist never knows anything bad happened to their patient unless the patient comes back to them. So there's a huge disconnect there. They never know of the harm. Just like the orthopedic surgeons that give the recommendation to take an antibiotic prophylactically before every dental visit, they absolutely never see the harm because that never gets back to the orthopedic surgeon. The dentist might know about it when the patient comes back in six months to get their teeth cleaned. Um, they might tell them, gee, last time I was here, you know, you gave me that antibiotic. Oh, I got really sick. Um, that might be the end of the conversation. Really sick. What does that mean? I don't know. Neither does the dentist. So public reporting of harm is something that really needs to occur. There needs to be a link to the person who prescribed the antibiotic if harm occurs. And that currently does not happen. We have public reporting of C. diff rates, but there's no linkage to the person who actually prescribed it. And so how can patients really become involved? One, if you have any side effect from an antibiotic given by any healthcare provider, please let them know about it. That's number one, how a patient can become their own best advocate. And then anytime a dentist or a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist prescribes an antibiotic, ask questions. What exactly why, what infection is it that I have and write it down. What do you think it is that I have? And how many days do I actually need to take this antibiotic? That to me is one of our lessons learned. Dentists prescribe antibiotics in seven, 10 and 14 day increments. Why? Same reason we do it in the hospital. That's what you were taught a decade ago. And now we know we can treat many infections for three to five days. And so part of our messaging to the dentist is shorter durations are effective. And what we've learned in talking with private practice dentists and orthopedic surgeons, so we did a community um, town hall meeting with Lori Hicks from the CDC and Denise Ricardo three years ago. We brought orthopedic surgeons and dentists in the same room and an evening program to help them each understand each other's perspective of why they tell their patients what they tell them about prophylaxis. And what came away, these were all private practice dentists and orthopedic surgeons. Many of them prescribe, not many, 88% said they prescribe antibiotics for defensive medicine, fear of a lawsuit, because consumers believe antibiotics prevent all harm. They prevent infections and they don't want infections. So, you know, the patient has a very important role in here. Uh, how we convey that is a lot of time and effort. But when you have private practice, orthopedic surgeons and dentists telling me 88% of them, I'm prescribing it out of fear of a lawsuit. And when you get sued in private practice, it's a little different than when you're working at Ohio State University under the umbrella of the university. And if you get a lawsuit, it is a horrible experience, but it's not any real personal financial loss for you. The university takes care of it. I don't want to trivialize that, but when you're in private practice and you have to go to a lawsuit and go to court, that is money out of your practice and it's devastating. And there is a financial component along with pride and loss of credibility. 
So there's a different motivation there and you have to understand that. That is never addressed in the guidelines. So when the ADA addresses antibiotic prophylaxis is mainly considered inappropriately, that term gives them an out. Who exactly are the exclusions? I don't know. I'm going to decide myself because I don't want to get a lawsuit because it's not definitive statements. There's a lot of wiggle room in the guidelines and therefore the private practice dentists simply aren't following them. They're doing what they've always been told. So I think we um, are very excited about our study. We're just in the beginning of it. I look forward to uh, hopefully publishing it at the end of the year with some uh, important lessons learned in working in the private practice arena. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thank you. Um Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, we've already heard from two wonderful experts in the field who've actually done some really nice previewing of, of some of the key points that I hope to make in, in my talk today. So I have to start by saying that I'm, I'm a sociologist. Uh, and I study antibiotics, which um, is a little bit unusual, although I hope that, you know, by the end of this whole panel today, you'll see why it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and as a sociologist, my area of focus and expertise and interest is really in understanding how humans interact with each other within context and how culture shapes what they do, what they think is important, what they worry about, um, and how they communicate with each other. And I utilize qualitative methodology, which basically means I talk to people or I observe them while they're at work and I learn about what it's like uh, to provide clinical care or what it's like to be a patient. Um, and I like to share in my talks uh, excerpts of data that really demonstrate um, sort of key concepts that really underpin these kinds of issues. And so I wanted to share this excerpt of an interview um, that I did with a pediatric general surgeon talking about uh, surgical site infections, but it really was related to antibiotic use. Um, so the surgeon says, if I see a patient a week after surgery and there's still a little redness and mom's nervous, I'm inclined to just put the kid on the antibiotic. It just makes everyone comfortable. And then a week later, the redness is gone. Did I treat an infection or was there just some redness, some inflammatory post-operative discharge? I don't know. I'm more careful about how I give antibiotics than I used to be in the past. You don't want to be part of the societal issue of creating superbugs, but it's surprisingly difficult to look mom in the face when she's convinced it's infected and you're trying to say, look, it's not infected when you didn't even know for sure yourself. And a week later, it could puss out. And mom's like, see, should have put her on antibiotics. I can't believe you did this to my kid. That's what you imagine the scenario being if you don't do something. It's so much easier to say, look, we'll put her on a little antibiotic. And so within this description of what it's like to sort of try to make a wise decision about antibiotics, it's clearly not just about a clinician applying objective medical knowledge to treat a pathogen, right? Medicine is a social form of, of, you know, applying knowledge and prescribing a drug is a social act. I mean, and that's because the work of providing care is people interacting together with people. Sick people are people, clinicians are people. Oftentimes they don't like to admit that, but they are. Um, and all of the social dynamics that underpin human interaction um, can be found in the clinic. And when we look at antibiotic use and some of the reasons why antibiotics might be overused, it's not just that clinicians don't know what to do, although that certainly can be a problem that the guidelines are not well distributed or there's not a good amount of evidence for clinicians to actually be applying. But even if they know what to do in a certain situation or they have evidence to guide them, there are a lot of different social factors that may drive a clinician to overuse antibiotics when it's not needed, including their interactions with their colleagues, their interactions with patients. We've already heard a lot about the uh, that Debbie mentioned, not prescri prescribing because you're afraid of negative outcomes. We heard about whether people perceive their own antibiotic use to be a problem or not, and then the context of clinical care. But I felt for, for this audience, I really wanted to focus on the clinician-patient interaction and relationship as being really critical. And, and I think it mostly, I'm going to focus mostly on outpatient antibiotic use because 
because I think that's a place where patients can really have the most impact. Um, so here's another excerpt of an interview that we did with a family medicine physician who described some of the challenges with, with using antibiotics appropriately in the outpatient setting. I need to meet them in some way that not just recognizes that I care about them, but also don't want them to suffer. Oftentimes people think if I don't give them something, I want them, them to suffer with their illness. That's not the situation as physicians know, but dealing with patient perception and getting over that hurdle is not always something I can do in 15 minutes. So you might think, and, and we've already sort of heard this, well, if clinicians are sort of the gatekeepers to antibiotic prescriptions, why don't they just hold their ground? Well, the reality is, is that when a clinician is in a busy setting under time pressure and they are getting a patient who you know, really wants an antibiotic, um, it can sometimes be difficult to, to, to withhold that prescription. And there are a lot of reasons why they might give in, but a, a number of them have to do with this sort of the social norms that are built into the sort of clinical relationship where it's like, you want to give the patient something. You don't want them to go home empty handed. Then there's the business aspect of this, particularly um, in primary care, urgent care settings where it's a market and there is a fear of losing patients to other practices that might be known as using antibiotics more liberally. This is something that comes up a lot in my work with primary care physicians where they're like, if I don't give the patient an antibiotic, they're just going to go to the urgent care down the street and get the antibiotic that they want. Um, patients are a lot more, um, uh, you know, empowered to provide feedback to clinicians, either directly through patient satisfaction surveys or even just publicly online. Um, and there's a lot of fear that clinicians have about angering or upsetting patients. They also talk a lot about how, you know, the, you know, if a patient wants an antibiotic and you tell them no, that the process of having to like have that discussion and explain why they're not necessary can be really unpleasant and it can take a lot of time. And again, if you think back to, you know, the family medicine physician that we just heard from, that you're having a really busy clinic day and you only have 10 to 15 minutes with a patient and you know you've got a waiting room full of other patients outside, having that conversation can be really, um, you know, it's easier to prescribe something than to engage in that that conversation. And then, of course, a desire to avoid conflict. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of ways, and we heard some really excellent um, multi-level approaches from David about how do we implement antibiotic stewardship in outpatient settings? How do we change, you know, the ways in which antibiotics are used in these diverse settings? And I think one of the elements that I and a lot of other really great researchers have focused on is communication. Communication between clinicians and patients about antibiotics um, is a really important uh, component of, you know, changing culture and changing social norms around antibiotic use in this setting. And so I recently uh, uh, published a paper with some colleagues, some clinicians in primary care and in um, uh, infectious diseases, where we actually went to, into some detail about the different ways in which patients respond to clinicians when they're denied an antibiotic that they think that they want. And there are a variety of these, what we call antibiotic appeals that can be tricky for physicians to navigate. And so some examples of appeals that we identified um, are, for example, but Dr. Smith has always given me antibiotics for these symptoms. That it reflects what Debbie was saying about this idea that, you know, a patient can sometimes be caught between two clinicians. They're, you know, some, something that someone has said to them in the past and then in their present moment with their clinician, um, you know, what the, what the clinician who's trying to be judicious is saying. And there can be this confusion or needing to contend with what's happened in the past. Another appeal is a patient saying, well, antibiotics are the only thing that will work when I have symptoms like these. And that may or may not be true, um, especially if the patient has gotten inappropriate antibiotics in the past. Another common one is, but I'm going on vacation next week. Can't you give me something? And so this idea that antibiotics are going to provide relief and, and be sort of a backup. And then the consumerist ethos. But I took time off of work to come here. Are you really saying you can't give me anything? So how can clinicians respond? Well, they can do a number of things. They can convey that the patient's well-being in the moment is the primary concern. So, you know, making the patient feel like, you know, you might have gotten things in the past, you know, 
um, or you might think that this is going to help you when you go on vacation. But really, I'm motivated by your well-being and applying what we know to be true about minimizing the risk of antibiotic use. Um, I think there's a lot of important empathetic uh, demonstration of communication that needs to happen. So recognizing that the patient's suffering is real and affirming the patient's decision to seek medical care. And then recognizing that there's a growing awareness about the harms of antibiotics that we've been hearing about. Um, patients may have had a long history of getting antibiotics for viral infections that they shouldn't have. And so I think everybody needs to recognize that knowledge is changing, norms are changing, and it doesn't mean that, you know, that what you always got is what you're always going to get. And finally, I wanted to end on, you know, what can patients do? I think a lot of this is about clinicians and having to sort of make decisions in these complex clinical situations, but patients also play a role. And I think the first key point is that I want to make is communication is a two-way street. I think that, you know, it's this recognition and awareness that antibiotics may not be needed, even if you've always gotten them in a similar situation. Um, I think patients can be open-minded when they go into an appointment, not making antibiotics a foregone conclusion. And then finally, be willing to engage in respectful dialogue, uh, to be willing to be honest about concerns, and then be willing to sort of say to the clinician, you know, okay, I'm not going to get antibiotics for this, but what should I do if things get worse? Um, and this is an evidence-based strategy of like, a plan B. So you can leave that appointment without getting the antibiotic, but you get knowledge about what to do if things get worse. Um, so I want to be mindful of our time so we have enough time for uh, questions and discussion. So I'll go ahead and, and end there. Um, and I'm happy to take emails to, from anybody if you're interested. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. I mean, did I tell you guys that this was like a powerhouse group or what? <laughs> um, and I, uh, I have learned so much from, from, from each of you over the years. It's incredible to me. Uh, I like, I'm constantly referring to something one of you has said. <laughs> um, so please do add your questions in the chat. Um, I guess we're going to start off with, um, so Debbie, you had uh, a slide that we wanted to check out um, about how a patient can be involved with their dentist. Uh, Carl, can we bring that up? Perfect. Thank you. So yes, I think after my husband's experience, I sat down with him and several other dentists and orthopedic surgeons to said, and there's a lot of in the literature about shared decision making. You know, dentists and, and orthopedic surgeons are, are trained in medicine, but everything we do, every surgical procedure, every dental procedure always has a risk and patients have to decide if they're willing to take that risk. So when you have orthopedic surgery, you're required to watch a risk video that says while you're under surgery, you could have an anaphylactic reaction to the anesthesia. You could have a blood clot and die. You, you know, there's, there's real risks in having surgery, and then you have to sign that. So I applied what we do in surgery to now the shared decision-making between a dentist and a patient. So you have the patient who was told by their orthopedic surgeon, take antibiotics for life every time you go see a dentist. The dentist can take this diagram, and this is published in a paper that we uh, have published. The risk of taking antibiotic prophylaxis versus the risk of a prosthetic joint infection, because that is real. So here, if I give you this antibiotic, here's the risk. One in, one in five will end up having a serious adverse event that requires a doctor visit or a visit to the hospital. Or you can develop this toxic form of diarrhea called C. diff. The antibiotic will disrupt your microbiome. Now, most consumers know what that is because you see the yogurt commercials and all the probiotics that are recommended. Your microbiome, when you take an antibiotic, is disrupted for one full year, one full year. And then you contribute to developing a superbug, those antibiotic-resistant bacteria that can just sit and live in your gut and if nothing happens to you, you might be fine. But let's say you got in a car accident. Now your immune system suppressed. That super bug is now going to become the pathogen to infect you. So those are real factual risks versus you go, okay, then I'm not going to take the antibiotic. 
there's no risk, right? Nope. You have less than 0.1% chance of getting a prosthetic joint infection. But the ADA, the American Dental Association, and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons no longer recommends this. And that's based on expertise and studies. So what would you like to do? And now the patient is involved in this decision. It's their body. You've informed them of the facts and now let them decide and sign this. And that decreases their fear of a lawsuit because in a court of law, you've gone through everything and the patient helped come to this decision. There are no guarantees in medicine. That's never reality. But this is a discussion you can have with the patient. Yeah, I think that's that's critically important. Um, you know, uh, a couple of years a couple of years ago, my brother's a plumber at Kings County, which is our big public hospital here in Brooklyn. Um, and you know, in the ten well, now it's going to be eleven years tomorrow. In the ten years since we lost mom, like he was offered antibiotics like three or four times for really minor things. Um, and he turned them down because uh, he said, you know, my mom had C. diff. I'd ra rather keep an eye on this. I work in a hospital. If it looks different, I'll come back. Um, but he drilled himself when he was doing some home construction. And the doctor, he's, Liam said to the doctor what he usually says. And the doctor said, well, with a puncture wound, we're concerned because we can't clean that out as well. So I really would advise this. Mm -hmm. And Liam took them. So, it, so it was the informed perspective being able to have that respectful dialogue that Julie mentioned um, and that you highlighted so well in that chart that we're totally stealing and putting on our website. Um, <laughs> that makes all the difference. The goal is to use it, not just sit in a paper and not make any impact. So I can send you a better copy. Um, <laughs> So stealing that, getting veneers from your husband. What else am I, what else is Debbie getting to this, this session? Um, so Deepa asks, uh, do you guys have any studies or intel on antibiotic prescribing by dermatologists? They seem to be top prescribers as well. So I don't, but I have colleagues at Penn who have done work in this. And it's interesting because they are large users of antibiotics. And I think that in the stewardship space, they, I mean, and maybe the other panelists know differently, but it seems like, you know, we started in the inpatient, then we're outpatient. Now we're talking about dentists. I've done work in veterinary medicine. So vets are another part of this. And obviously, you know, it's not human, but the development of antibiotic resistance. And I think that dermatology is going to be a new, a new domain as well. And I'm trying to find some papers that I can share with data on dermatologists, but there's room for improvement, just like in every other clinical specialty that you look at. So. Yeah. And the national numbers, um, they, they do rank pretty high. I mean, they, they take up about 3% of all outpatient prescribing, which is about 7 million prescriptions a year. So, um, you know, if you, if they're kind of fifth place, I guess it, it's a dentist is fourth place and then yeah, primary care doctors is the highest. And then the, the group that's coming up, um, pretty fast in the last five years is the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants. And that's largely due to the expanded, um, expansion of urgent care centers and retail clinics. Most, um, that's likely driving those, um, the prescribing numbers. But Julie, I think. <laughs> You know, what you learn from this is even though they're only 3%, that's 7 million prescriptions a year, are we teaching in medical school anything about stewardship? And that's where the problem lies. If they don't learn it there, they're, you know, they're not like, we only have so many hours to go do, quote, stewardship. And so that's the problem. It needs to be on the curriculum of every dental, nursing, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, every specialty. And that's where academics needs to make that change. Yeah, I, I just want to say that's really critically important because, you know, it, we've got to change social norms about these drugs. You know, I, the, the surgeon in my study said, you know, we'll just put her on a little antibiotic. The perception is antibiotics are just, they're magical and they're not really that big of a deal. And I think that, you know, even though only certain people can prescribe, other people who are involved in clinical care, like nurses, you know, have a role to play in, does this patient really need this? And, you know, maybe the patient really does need this, but just asking the question, Christian, like your brother said, do I really need this? Like, that is wh how we're going to slowly turn the tide. I think, you know, it's one of the elements that's going to make 
it's not just, you know, you going around and bugging people to use antibiotics better. It's like, we are all <laughs> changing our attitude towards this. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, so one of our advocates, Carol Ray, says that she's very fired up about this. Uh, and she wants to know how to reach out to the dental association in her state. She's, she's in uh, Idaho. Uh, Debbie, could, could we reach out to them? Do you think they'd be receptive? Yeah, so the dental boards um, are very receptive because the ADA is opposed to antibiotic prophylaxis in orthopedic surgeons, uh, in orthopedic surgical patients. So they're not really the barrier, but what they can provide is an avenue to try to educate dentists. Just don't title the talk dental antibiotic stewardship. You'll have no one on it. And so... <laughs> To me, that's part of the lessons we're learning right now. Um, you know, we have a very small study because I'll be honest, it was incredibly hard to recruit the private practice dentists that have to listen to our webinars at night. And there's only three of them. And these are a lot of them are very personal friends of my husband. Um, it has it was phenomenally hard because it's hard to get them engaged in something they don't see a need for. And so now when we had our first webinar after, I can't tell you the effort it took me to make sure they were on there, basically threatening text messages, going, you better be on here. It's starting in 15 minutes. I don't see you logged in. Um, after we had our discussion, um, I've given many lectures. I've never gotten 17 thank you notes. They were incredibly appreciative and it's been an amazing experience. My goal is we need to scale it up. So we're in the beginning of the study. We're not done with it. But um, I am beyond excited about it because I'm seeing a difference after one learning session. So I feel um, there's a powerful opportunity here. So, yes, I would say whoever asked that question, um, we you could reach out to the dental board and uh, I'd be happy to talk to them on your behalf or something like that, uh, because I don't see them really as the barrier. They can be the conduit to helping to spread it. And that is our goal. A lot of the dentists we're working with are very connected to the ADA, the American Dental Association, and this can be scaled up. And so that is obviously what I'm hoping to achieve. Okay, so our next question is from uh, Gerard Honig, and he writes a uh, long question alert. Uh, in the last session with Greg Gonzalez, we talked about the need to expand research opportunities into broader settings, e.g. community settings, to improve impact. Uh, here we also learned about the importance of this. Are there tangible steps we can advocate for to promote more research in understudied settings? Anybody? <laughs> I can start off. Um, no, that's, I mean, that's an extremely important area. And this is the primary reason why we're, when you look at out, where outpatient stewardship is compared to hospital stewardship, it's it's that research gap. I mean, it, 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 the, everything did start out in hospital settings, but, and it's gotten a lot better in the outpatient settings in general. But as you heard, once you start diving into the deep, like these individual, these specific pockets of outpatient settings, what is dentist, dermatology, um, then you start realizing, well, we don't have data in here, you know, and another example is telemedicine you know telemedicine sort of exploded out onto the scene the past year during the pandemic and now there's a certain, certain uh, increased level of urgency and interest to figure out how antibiotics are being prescribed so it does take up a lot of resources to try to answer and figure out how to improve antibiotics in these very different um, but somehow connected different types of outpatient settings um, and, and of course, you know, a lot of these fundings, usually research fundings and opportunities usually come from the, you know, the federal to the state. And so the, the in terms of, you know, um, federal funding for research, and that is the biggest pocket of, of resources we have available. Some of the health systems, depending on how prominent your health, local health system is or the health system in your state, may have some additional resources to, de to dedicate towards this. I would also last put a plug in here that says, it's not just the, the research of the you know, antibiotic prescribing or the implementation of science research, but there is an opportunity here to do actually start implementing some of these stuff. We have, we have enough data where there is opportunity for state health departments and, you know, for instance, 
Boston's to start expanding their stewardship scope into ambulatory care settings. A lot of outpa- health systems or health, health departments are ready to do that, or I should say were ready to do that back before the pandemic, but now they're in a very, you know, a severe resource crunch where they're going to need a lot of support and especially from funding from funding standpoint to be able to build up their capacity to provide community level support for improving antibiotic use. Um, <clears throat> so we had a couple more comments, but I don't think they really have questions and we're almost at time. Um, so before I thank you all for being here, the one thing that I would say is both in my presentation this morning, if people saw that, and then again in, uh, oops. All right, let me, uh, so here's one last question. Do you think pregnant people should be skeptical, worried about prophylaxis antibiotic use? And what role do you think midwives can play in advocating for their patients? Well, anytime, uh, any pregnancy, you wanna be skeptical about receiving any drug ever, uh, especially in the first trimester. But there are very specific guidelines. Um, So group B strep, women are screened for that. And if you are positive, you absolutely have to have an antibiotic before delivery or you will transfer that to the newborn. So, you know, we don't want to leave the audience with the idea there's no role for prophylactic antibiotics. There are certainly indications and you would definitely harm your child by refusing to take that antibiotic. So, um, you know, midwives would, I'm sure, be educated to know that and be uh, compliant with that. But anytime any pregnant woman would want to question any drug they're being asked to take because there's risks involved. Yeah, so before I let you all go, the the last thing that I would want to say on this matter is that, you know, both my presentation and Greg Gonzalez's presentation right before this, um, I would say, you know, the pocket of money that David referred to, right, from NIH and stuff, like, <clears throat> so I think I'm going back to 2016, it's the last time that I can remember off the top of my head, but that year there was $3 billion spent on HIV and AIDS. And I don't want to take a penny away from HIV and AIDS, but there was only about $330 million spent on antimicrobial resistant infections and C. diff. So I would say as health citizens, the term that we learned earlier, we all need to be advocating, and many of us will be doing this tomorrow during our virtual lobby day, to all of our federal legislators to say, we need more money to go into these pots that can then get put down to the state level to do the community-based research. Because right now, most states don't have that in their budgets, and they're relying on CDC and other federal agencies to make grants at the local level. So if you're not one of our advocates, uh, you can become one. If you want to just reach out to your elected officials, this is something that, as we were talking about earlier, you don't hear this when people run for governor. You don't hear this when people run for president. Nobody's asking about these issues. Maybe post-COVID, they will get more of these questions. But you have every right to ask these questions right now for anybody who represents you. Um, And so with that, I would just, I'm so grateful to David, Debbie, and Julie uh, for joining us today. I think it was such an informative session. Um, Again, uh, you know, I was telling Greg that he's one of my activist inspirations and you three are uh, among my sort of medical uh, <laughs> I don't know what quite to refer to you as, but like my intellectual as- inspirations, like I learned so much from each of you um, every time we talk. And I'm so glad that we got to share that with our advocates and with the rest of the audience. Um, so thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. This is this is the, the end of our first day of our CDF uh, Advocacy Summit for 2021. Um, Hopefully next year we'll be in person, uh, but tomorrow's our virtual lobby day. And then on Thursday, we have an incredible lineup of speakers and presentations, uh, including Tessa Miller, uh, the recent, the author of the recent, What Doesn't Kill You. We have a panel in the afternoon on the unmet treatment need around C. diff. Um, We're also going to have Ask an Advocate Anything. Uh, So really, really exciting. Uh, presentations and panel discussions and roundtable discussions on Thursday. Please do join us then. Uh, And thank you so much to everyone, uh, including our event planner, Kate Talbert from Argus Events, our tech guy, Carl, who's amazing in the background, and my 
coworker Bernie who have really helped pull this entire thing together. Um, so more info, more fun, more interesting stuff to learn on Thursday and probably a lot more thank yous as well. So have a great day.